I'm going in there and I'm going to try my damnedest to knock the shit out of him. Hello everyone and welcome to MMA Start to Finish. I'm Julian and this is Matt. Hello. Today we're going to be talking about UFC 20. It is quite the infamous event. We'll get into that uh, very soon. Uh, as a little bit of a foreshadowing and spoiler, Kevin saying he was going to knock the shit out of Boss was correct, but not everybody in Alabama agreed. We're back in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, the Boutwell Auditorium. I think we've been here a few times at this point. Yeah, this is one of the um, gymnasiums that the <laughs> yeah. promotion has been relegated to in the South after its banning in much of the like every state pretty much they had to yeah. get rid of the high school mats and put out this octagon yeah you want to know how vaunted these venues are when you click on them on wikipedia pretty much the only thing that's like in their credits is like a meaningful event are these ufc events like literally nothing else of significance has happened in these buildings and back then, these were not events of significance. They're only significant because of what the UFC became. Yeah. So. It's just the history of Not it. to dump on the show immediately, but well, it's just true, you know? We're in the Dark Ages. Yeah. And we got a lot of new people tonight. And we actually see Big Dan as one of our judges. Yeah. Not to get ahead of ourselves, but we had suspected he'd do a great job. Perhaps... The misconception, Everyone given has how early sport was in its development. And we got a few things back that we desperately needed. Yes. We, the tail of the tape is back, as you can see. We've got White Clock back. It's such a blessing for us. It's, it helps our notes out a lot, I'll tell you that. Just a lot, of, a lot of improvements that help us on our end and make the show look better. A lot of quality of life improvements. Yeah. And as you can see, the tail of the tape is back, and let's get into the two gentlemen on our tail of the tape and the, the angry man from our intro who would only get angrier. For the new UFC heavyweight champion of the world, Boss So before the fight, I actually knew about this being one of the largest robberies, and I don't use that term lightly, the largest robberies in MMA history. Matt did not. I did so, not. So as they were reading the decision at the end after Kevin Randleman thoroughly beat the shit out of Boss Rutten, I turned and I just looked at Matt, and I was just staring at him, waiting for them to read the decision. And yeah, you don't usually like wear your emotions on your face too much about stuff, yeah. but you're literally your jaw dropped. You were like... Yeah. Mouth agape, like, <laughs> what the fuck did I just see? You Cause, said, no. Because no. it didn't seem like it could be true, and yet it Shouldn't was. Yeah, please, tell me, tell me what was going through your mind. So, immediately I'm thinking, did they just mix the two up? <laughs> they forget who was who. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, did they confuse the large black man and the slender dude from Northern Europe? You never know. W one of the judges was an old woman. I think she had some kind of background with a martial art. Sure. But, or like maybe sure the boxing. judges are very qualified. It's not like we had a former NFL player judge one of these things a couple <sighs> years ago. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, Dan, <laughs> I don't know what his background is at this point. But he gets a background to the point where we, we respect him these Dan, days. Dan does eventually, uh, for those who don't know who Big Dan is, Dan Regaliata was one of the judges apparently for this card and he would become one of the best referees in the MMA today. So, nothing but love for contemporary Big Dan, but Big Dan judging this fight, not so bueno. Well, maybe he was one of the judges. Was it a split decision? It was, and they read off who rendered which decision, and I was hoping this wasn't the case. Big Dan was one of the two judges, because it was a split decision, who scored the fight for Boss. All right. fucking crazy. Dan little disappointed in you 
I, I mean, I don't, I don't have any stats on the fight, unfortunately, but I, I'd hazard to guess just roughly that 70% of the fight was just Kevin Randleman on top of Boss Rutan doing like some ground and pound. So let's yeah, let's act, let's actually get into the yeah the meat of the fight. Uh, just off the top of my head, in my notes, I count one, two, three, four, five, at least five different times I noted a takedown from Kevin. It was almost always them on the feet, they go to the ground until either there was the stand-up for checking Boss's nose or the two overtimes we had. So that's already three right there. And then the very first time when they had to go to the ground... So they probably just got up naturally at one point, I can't remember when, and then went back down to the ground. And for anybody who's listening to this that might not actually watch the fight, this wasn't some lay and pray ground and pound. At the roughly the five minute mark, Big John had to pull Kevin off of Boss to check a pretty serious cut on Boss's nose. This is five minutes into a fight that would go like... What, what, what is the full length of this fight? Because it's not the length of fights we have now. So it was There's a 12 minute, then the 3 minute overtime, then another. So 18 minutes. So it's an 18 minutes. minute fight. 5 minutes into this fight, so about like roughly a third into the fight, Big John already has to step in to check a cut. So, not, not just your run of the mill going through the positions here. Yeah, he wasn't just sitting there. He never advanced to a finish, though. No, he did not, not for lack of effort, though. Kevin tried a few times, and then Boss did return with some armbar attempts. He struck off his back a little bit. Boss tried what he could. I think he was just a little undersized for this fight. Not to, like, spoil things or get ahead, eventually in his career, Boss would move down to the lower weight class in the UFC because he's a little slender for heavyweight. Yeah. Just to, just to like, just to quantify things from what I have in my notes... I have maybe three points of, like, positivity for Boss. There's him striking off his back. He had some leg kicks in the second overtime. And what else did I have here? I think, he, didn't he offer a couple submission attempts from his back when Kevin was on top of him? Nothing that worked, obviously. Nothing worked. He did try a few times. There couple. was something else other than the armbar. I think there was, it wasn't an ankle lock. But he offered some sort of threat. Yeah. But that was only a, a few times here. Literally every other note I have is about Boss bleeding out of his eyes, uh, John stepping in to check the cut, nonstop domination from Kevin. E easy decision. On no planet should any judge have ever given this fight to Boss. I really can't express that enough if you haven't seen this. I remember when we had finished watching it, I was trying to find the rationalization of giving it to Boss. From at least one of the judges, unless they were just totally bought. And it was something along the lines of, well, Kevin never got a finish, so he maybe isn't that great on top, but Boss was never able to get out from under there, so clearly Kevin showed domination in that regard. This is me trying to get their perspective, if they're being genuine in their decision making i don't think this is like an act of malice i just think it's incompetence i think it's i don't understand wrestling i only understand like boxing and karate and i put way too much weight into the like 15 seconds where there were leg kicks going on and i put a little too much weight into the crowd getting kind of tired of the grounded pound there was there was a times it got a couple times it got stale Big John did stand them up, but even with that, it's still, like, thoroughly clear that Kevin Randleman won this fight. And I think Mark Coleman, who was in Kevin's corner, felt pretty comfortable with it, too. And even offered some little dirty advice of... Oh my god, I forgot, yeah. Telling Kevin to smear Boss's blood into his eyes so he can't see. You know, don't hate the player, hate the game, He's etc. Very opportunistic for sure brazilian jiu-jitsu and muay thai expert pedro hizo made his octagon debut at ultimate brazil with pinpoint accuracy and quick powerful shots this young heavyweight dominated tank abbott en route to a knockout victory 
He returned at UFC 18 to take on Mark the Hammer Coleman using leg kicks, solid punches, and good defense on the ground. Hizzo outscored the former champ and took the split decision victory. He returns tonight to put his undefeated record on the line. Up next in the co-main event, we have the disciple of Marco Huas, who they told us was returning to action, but we'll get more into that later. Pedro Hizzo taking on Trey Telegman, who we have not seen since UFC Japan. For those of you who don't remember, Trey Telegman is the man who is incredibly jacked, except for the peck he is missing, which, if my memory serves me correct, he lost that peck in, like, very early childhood. Yeah, it was and just like, like a car accident up. or something. Yeah, or was injured in some way by a vehicle. Yeah. Then, I guess that was the part they had to remove. Or, or just was like, um, unviable after the accident, so it just didn't develop with the rest of them. He was, he was too strong, he had to be nerfed. They nerfed Trey. This fight went pretty quick, if I remember correctly. Yeah, um... Before we get into the actual contents of the fight, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the fact that on the tail of the tape, oh, yeah. it says we do not know how much Trey weighs. Now, this is not 1994 where this is like, I mean, it is not exactly like a upscale operation, but by now you think we could put some motherfuckers on a scale? Yeah. Especially at heavyweight where no one cares how much you weigh. Maybe... Maybe if I'm being charitable, they just didn't want to weigh Trey because they would have, they would have, uh, you would have noticed he would have weighed less than you'd expect, maybe? Maybe by like a few pounds. Yeah. Five pounds I'm just at trying most. to like maybe find some sort of justification, much like you were for the decision earlier, mm -hmm. for why they wouldn't put this dude on a scale. I'm sure they had access to a scale. It's like, they measured his height, they know how tall he is, they know his age. So this was a brawl, pretty much immediately. That is my first note. It's an absolute brawl. Just <laughs> madness, <laughs> chaos. Both of them just throwing haymakers, and Pedro throwing with a lot of juice. I was a little con like I think I said this the very first time we saw a Trey fight, of how like I wonder if I know what you're people say. target that spot where he's missing a peck. If that's like a vulnerable spot, or if that's. A worse spot to hit because it's not flesh and muscle you're hitting. That's just like straight rib cage. I don't know. I really don't know. Is that like a dirty move or it, is that something you want to avoid? It's like... like imagine punching someone's knee. It just feels mean. You know what I mean? Even if it's not like against the rules. But not like we don't have some mean motherfuckers in here, so I'm sure somebody at some point in his career had to have tried it. I mean, like, when you damage someone enough in, enough in one area, you target that area because now it's their weak point. Yeah, but you, did, you didn't do this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> a car did that. Yeah, you were behind the wheel. So it was, it was a competitive brawl at first for the first minute or so. But after things settled in... And Pedro decided to keep this on the feet after a knockdown. We got our KO punch. It was a hefty one. Pedro sent Trey to the Shadow Realm. Not much to add. Yeah. Uh, he, he beat him. It was a good hit. I think this fight was only like three minutes. It was about four and a half minutes is what four I have in my notes. It always feels shorter. But, yeah, they had that great brawl in the beginning. They kind of gassed each other out, then just, it was touch and go, and then they went back to add it again. I will add, it was very smart of Pedro to not, like, just jump into Trey's guard. Not that, it, I'm sure he was, I'm sure he was competent on the ground, but he knew he clearly had the advantage striking, that he was just a larger man, so why enter any different realm? Just don't, don't fix what isn't broken, you know? And, uh... It worked out. Things are going well for Pedro. Taking out Mark in a close decision and now taking out Trey, who has a, somewhat of a name in the UFC. Maybe we'll see him challenge, I guess, Boss. But, like, should be Kevin. Bruce. Up next, fresh off his knee bar victory at UFC 19, we have Pete Williams taking on Travis Fulton. 
This is Travis Fulton's UFC debut, but don't you be fucking fooled. This man is certainly not inexperienced. Matt, over how many fights has this man had at, by that point in 1999? Apparently over 70 fights. Over 70 fucking fights by the year 1999. The sport had only been around, in terms of like the UFC existing, for six years. How do you have 70 fights in six years? That's more than 10 fights a year. When did, let's look, take a moment to see when Travis Fulton's MMA career began. Holy shit. He didn't even start until 1996. Jesus Christ. He did 70 all that in three fights years? happened in three years. That's multiple fights a month. This, uh, easily multiple fights a night, which is easy, I guess, to facilitate when you're in tournaments and all these rinky-dink promotions across the planet that don't care about your humanity and don't mind making you fight three, four, five times a night. It was probably offshoots like that, like what we had with the oh, early UFC. I mean, we have, we have the thing up, but we have the Wikipedia up right now. You can take a look for yourself and just look at his record and see how many of these fights took place on one night. Just looking here, I see at least three on September 10th, two on December 13th, two on February 20th, two on March 9th. There's a lot of at least two a nights in here. The contemporary Travis Fulton has, just go to the top here, look at his mixed martial arts record, has 320 fights. So he, what you're telling me, fucking God, is sir. he fought for another few years and then left? Yeah, this man had no lasting staying power whatsoever. Kind of trailed off after getting into a couple tussles. So this fight was very close. There was a lot of back and forth, especially early on. Uh, both exchanging strikes, Travis throwing punches, Pete throwing kicks, Travis, Travis, Travis initiating a clinch. And there was a lot of back and forth of, like, who was on top of the other one. Once we got into the grappling. Yeah. Travis, I believe, was the one who actually took things to the ground once they were in the clinch with a takedown. Yeah, and they stayed there for a little bit, and Pete got out, and he had more leg kicks. They... Went it back down to the ground, but Pete got on top this time. Yeah, and around the five minute mark, Pete actually wound up attempting a leg lock on Travis, but it did not bear fruit. He even got full mount at one point, but Travis managed to escape. However, all of his defense was uh, for naught, as in the end, our friend Pete would defeat the man with potentially the most fights in MMA history via armbar. Pretty, pretty nasty looking armbar too, belly down. Yeah, that's never a fun one to look at. So this was a, it was a pretty competitive fight. I don't know if I'd give it our uh, fight of the night award that we sometimes remember to give out, sometimes don't. It was competitive. What's wild though, is that uh, this was our second longest fight, and it was 6 minutes and 28 seconds. There was a lot of finishes tonight. And while we were watching this, this was our fifth fight. And we were halfway through the the run length on Fight Pass. Yeah. Yeah. And there were only th those two fights we just told you about left. We got real concerned. <laughs> I knew that the Boss and Kevin fight went to decision, but I had forgotten how the co-main event went, so I was concerned we were going to have several long decisions. They gave us a lot of padding. So, yeah, we had to press the speak button. Because there's just a lot, a lot of buildup for a, a fight that presumably, if you were watching this, you had already paid for. Very weird. It was like promotional buildup equivalent. I mean, there was a like, to get into something I mentioned earlier. There was a little bit of talk about the next card, how Marco Huas will be returning. However, most of the jibber jabber was focused around the fight that was happening later in the night. Now you were only privy to this jibber jabber if you'd already fucking paid for the fight so like why there's yeah. other ways to kill time that are like more beneficial to you like, yell at us to call our state officials more like that would have been preferable to me i don't know just keeping people's attention i guess like don't don't hit pause in your vcr we're getting a little sidetracked but to get back into the fight i do just want to note that um after losing travis said well when you get to this level it's uh more of the fact you're here than the fact you win. I don't care if I win or lose. It's how you play the game. Which is very interesting. But I guess his record bears that out. He just wants to get out there and compete, brother. He just likes fighting people. 
win or lose. See, it's like the that's like the positive version of Tank Abbott. Yes. Tank's just like, I'm gonna fight people to hurt people. Gravis is like, I'm gonna fight people for fun. Forever. But I don't care if I lose, I just like doing it. I once heard somebody say, um, how many fights you have is really no indicator of like how good of a fighter you are. Because if that were the case, Travis Fulton would be the greatest fighter of all time. <laughs> I mean, not wrong. He's a well experienced fighter. I have nothing but respect for our boy Travis here. Um, it's just fucking crazy to see a man with more fights than the Spartans had men. <laughs> what did they fill all that time with? Aside from just boss hype. There's a lot of UFC matchmaker John Peretti talking to us about stuff. So much of it. So unimportant. I didn't take a single damn note. That was just I have bored no notes out of, of it my either. fucking mind. It wasn't important. Like I said. And like, for those of you who are not familiar with our show, it's not like we're always bored by the stuff that happens between the fights. Sometimes that's interesting. Oftentimes we have notes about it. This was just so vapid and meaningless that we didn't take a single damn note. And it was also super long. So, for, for those of you unaware, we, we do often take notes about this in-between stuff, like them yelling at us to call our like cable company, or them hyping up other fights that are not on the card, but this was just empty and meaningless. Like, this was a pay-per-view fight, wasn't it? Yeah, there's, they had no really other medium to deliver. This was a pay-per-view fight, but you gotta keep in mind. Well, it could have been like they just recorded it and then sold, sold it on home it. video? Yeah. Well, I'm sure these events actually wound up grossing more on home video than oh, yeah. they did on pay-per-view. I'm just wondering if they like, even bothered to do pay-per-view at that point. It probably mm -hmm. cost more to just get that as a thing. I suppose. There was very few. There was, like, to my knowledge, maybe only one company that actually continued to carry them. Um... At this point, I think they eventually wind up shouting out that satellite or cable company, whatever it was. But is uh again, I know I say this a lot. We are in the dark ages. The MMA plague is here. It has wiped out all good press and legal status for our beloved sport. Ron Waterman, a high school art teacher who specializes in pottery and sculpturing. If you have a problem with that, you tell Ron Waterman. If he's an art teacher, look at the way he's sculpted. No question, a sculpted body for a sculptor. All right, now it is time for the clown show exhibition of the evening. We have the sculpted art teacher. Get it, Ron Waterman. Taken on the, and this is directly from my notes, noob with jujitsu experience, air quotes, Chris Kondo. This fight felt like it belonged more in a pride ring than a UFC cage, in terms of the freak show element. Not to be rude. That's a good way to put it. it they, pride goes a little more over the top with it. They get actual sumo wrestlers. Yes. Uh, Chris Kondo is just a large man they pulled from the crowd who took his kid to karate once and thought it was jujitsu. So I know it sounds like we're being a little mean, but uh, if you watched this 28 second fight, you wouldn't be so nice either. So I'll, I'll just go through the notes. There is a quick takedown by Ron, followed by a barrage. And then Chris is like, oh, so this is what it feels like to be punched in the face. And then he taps out. Ron immediately got mount after... Immediately. No resistance whatsoever from the dude with jujitsu experience. Using quote hands. Angry quote hands. He was able to mold Chris into... Oh, jeez. Any shape His he liking? Wanted. Yeah. Dude, the... the He's the, very malleable. For the... For this fight lasting 30 seconds, the just sheer volume of fucking art puns commentary got out was impressive. Yeah. They got most of it out, I think, when uh, he was walking out. They just yeah. kept saying he was sculpted. It was, it was fair, the same joke over and over again, yeah. To be fair, he was a very muscular man. He yeah. looked more like the scary gym teacher <laughs> than, than the art teacher. Than the art <laughs> At first, we were kind of confused because it looked like kind of a early stoppage. Early it, for most men um, by Big John, 
Although I will say I was a little sympathetic to the stoppage given Chris Kondo's uh, conditioning. But upon further review, we can see that uh, he actually tapped to the strikes. Yeah, we thought it was... Uh, I actually have it in my notes. It was... I have called at... Crossed that out. I have tapped at 28 second mark. Because he was still cognizant. He just realized this is not where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be in the audience. I think at this point, they realized... Half of their like, allotted time to have these fights was just about up. And so they, they started putting anything they could in as padding. And they actually started going into the lore, I guess, at this point, of how Randy Couture kind of screwed over the heavyweight class. He made it like he abandoned the child, yes. Yeah. They even had like a this whole video set up. A little intro cinematic about how... Randy Couture left the heavyweight division, abandoned his crown. And then we had to pick up the pieces and create a new kingdom. Kingdom is now fraudulent. Yeah. 5'7", 169 pounds, now fighting out of Astoria, New York, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu master. Self-trained and managed by Jose Luis Casamatori. Saying about his opponent, he has not heard of him, but it does not matter who I fight. Up next in this lightweight contest, we have the 19-year-old who prompted me and Matt to look up who the youngest UFC competitor was, which was uh, Joe Lozon's brother at 18, by the way. So uh, how do you set a record? Nepotism. Taking on Marcelo Mello, <laughs> who apparently has trained with Hoyler Gracie, which is kind of cool. Um, I'd love to learn more about these guys, but we've looked no Wikipedia entries for either of them, so you not know, an entirely consequential fight. I wonder if Mello ever got like an ad deal with Mellow Yellow Soda. I like I like where your head's at. Because I feel like if he had his prime when the UFC was in like maybe two thousand five, he could have got that ad deal. You know? Yeah, capitalist at heart. Yeah. Uh, also, I just realized, David, who is 19 in this time, this video, he was 13 when the first UFC came out. And he was like, this seems sick, I'm going to get on this. Yeah. I would also like to point out that 19 and 26 are not the only large uh, disparities we have in the statistic department for this fight. The young boy, David Roberts... Stands at six foot one, weighing 169 pounds. M Marcelo Mello, also 169 pounds. How tall is he? Fucking five four. You can see. I, I mean, I'm not here to make fun of the man. I'm just, I'm just surprised that like he's stepping in there with a dude who's seven inches taller than him. And I'm sorry. I think you're like right. nine inches taller than him. Oh. It's a weird setup. Not it's not the bizarreness that we're seeing from Pride, where it's like large sumo versus tiny man. It's like a young tall versus adult short. He's not old. Yeah, not like a tall young, real young guy versus like a short old man. What's funny is that um, like the first note I have is uh. Mellow is so small, and then like the sub note I have is didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it only took a minute and twenty three seconds for the smaller Mellow to obtain full mount and finish with elbows from back mount, brutally taking out this poor young boy. Oh yeah, that that is this is all my notes. My first note is Mello gets Mount and annihilates David. <laughs> the whole fucking fight. Dude, we said it earlier. Like, every fight on this card, with the exception of the main event, was a finish. Then uh, Mello got into rear mount and just drived some elbows into all of David's head and neck. And Big John is just like, holy shit, stop. I don't it's time to stop. I don't want to clean this. After this fight, we had a little bit of more filler with John Peretti calling Vanderlei the axe murderer. Who is the fight? We'll 
talk about next. You were not taken back, but like a little surprised to hear that I, I did not know that they were calling Vanderlei the Axe Murderer back in 1999. I had kind of just assumed that was a nickname that developed as this time in Pride went on, which hasn't even really begun yet. But apparently, at least John Peretti is familiar with him as the axe murderer all the way back in 99, and like early 99 too, which is weird for me. If you know anything about the origins of that nickname, um, I'm too lazy to go to Wikipedia, so leave a comment. And his opponent, standing to my right, a Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu fighter with a mixed martial arts record of 8 and 2. Speaking of Vanderlei, he is back here to avenge his brutal KO loss to Vitor. Uh, the last time we saw him, getting uh, taken down by Vitor's machine guns. Mm -hmm. Still spelling his name incorrectly, might I add. Taking on Tony Patera. This was yet another quick fight. Yes. Very many quick bouts tonight. This was the Vanderlei I'm more familiar with. The I love to knee people in the face Vanderlei. The Muay Thai murderer Vanderlei. I'm glad you are finally getting to see Vanderlei who's not just Vitor's punching bag for the first time. <laughs> With mean knees. I'm re-remembering this ending of the fight. It looks real bad. It's pretty brutal. Yeah. The knees were... um. Very accurate, and it didn't seem like Tony had prepared for that element. Mm -mm. So, we had Tony initiating the clinch, which was probably a bad move for him. Yeah, I don't know how familiar he is with uh, where Muay Thai takes place. And Silva did not want to give up the clinch, and Tony didn't really catch on that, so he just kept with the clinch, even when they were going off the fence. They stayed together. Yeah, Vandy kind of just whipped him around and uh, beat him into the Shadow Realm. Silva had those double underhooks, and so he just went to town with those knees like he was marching down the street. And eventually, Tony just kind of crumples a little bit, and Silva takes all the advantage of that, grabs his head, and blasts his skull into Neptune. One more time. And, uh, and again, we've said that there's been a lot of finishes, but to reiterate, another fight... It didn't even last three minutes. And then we had a Pat Millis interview and Mike Goldberg saying that his fights are boring, but he wins. Yeah, that was weird. It was a very weird and awkward interview by Mike Goldberg, yeah. which, not to be rude, not shocked. He really did just, like, say his fights weren't that interesting. They're, like, he <laughs> yeah. stays on the ground and doesn't move. I love Mike Goldberg, but be a little kinder to Pat, man. Basically he just told him you're a boring fuck. Like, even if Why do you get wedgied, loser? Why don't you just say that to him? <laughs> like, even if Mike's kind of right... Yeah. You can say it in a better way of, like, you spend a lot of your time on the ground grappling with people. Yeah. Well, even if he's right, just from, like, a marketing standpoint, of like, we're the UFC, we need to market one of our more successful champions. And then just, like, suggest that maybe you should pursue finishes more. Maybe, so that, maybe suggest that... So that you aren't fighting the clock as much. Not in front of the camera. Well, I think constructive criticism is always good. I don't know, and it just feels I don't think weird. They're... I don't I feel like it would have been less weird hearing it come from Jeff. Just because, like, Jeff has, like, martial arts experience. <laughs> and I'm sure at some point in his life, uh, Mike Goldberg pursued some sort of, like, martial arts classes. But, like, not the same thing as the Olympic wrestler, maybe giving you some tips about your game plan. Yeah. But it's just kind of like Mike Goldberg, who called hockey games before this. All right. But like... Which is awesome. I love hockey, but... Considering where know. we are in the sport right now, the judges aren't very good or can be easily influenced from what we've seen, whether it be in the UFC or Pride. So I think... Goldberg positioning the quest or framing the question in the sense of maybe you should look for submission finishes. Like for your own sake. For your own sake so that you aren't being left up to the judges. 
So that way you can decide how the fight ends instead of relying on the interpretation sounds, of people who may not be aware of what's going on. Sounds like Mike might have been a little clairvoyant about the main event that would uh, for, would come later that night. Like, hey buddy, these judges ain't on your side. These judges ain't on the side of truth. They're on the side of whoever they bet on. <laughs> Just a joke. Don't hurt Nevada me, Nevada State Athletic Commission. Don't send people after us. We know you have the connects. I guess this would be the Alabama State Athletic We have not seen a tap at this point. LeBert trying to spin out of it. Can he get the heel hook? Yamasaki stepping in. In the last fight of the night for us, and the really the first fight of the night in actual reality, we have Laverne Clark taking on Fabiano Iha. We have not seen Iha before. We have not seen Clark before. But apparently, Clark has already fought twice in the UFC. Just uh, not on the main card. Therefore, not a part of the show. Yeah. Of our show. I wonder if he was ever responsible for some of those giant blood stains we've seen. I was thinking that too. He may have been responsible for some of those because we had, not to get too spoilery, we had a big cut that we did stop for. It did seem like his fight style uh, would lead to a little bit of leakage, perhaps. <laughs> so Fabiano apparently is a disciple of Marco. Anytime you tell me you've trained with the king of the streets, Gonna get me very excited. Uh, Clark was a boxer with high school wrestling experience, which is always good, especially early on, to have that kind of cross training, just so that like, even they said he was a Golden Gloves boxer, so obviously he'd prefer to keep things on the feet. But having that high school wrestling experience lets him do that. He lets him have control over where the fight takes place. So while Iha may have been a pupil under Marco Huas. I feel like his kicks weren't very well trained. No, he seemed like more of a grappler man to me. Or a, a these grappler some, man to me. These are some huge soccer kicks he was swinging. Not the best technique. They're highly telegraphed and they took a while to recover from as far as like for himself. Like he'd spun around, or he just has a long time of getting his legs back into position. It was like recoil time. Yeah. And uh, Clark also was able to defend his takedowns early pretty effectively. Mm -hmm. And at one point, Clark cracked Eha pretty fucking bad. And as you alluded to earlier, busted that man open. Yeah, and then left some stains on the ground. And it took them a. Few not a few minutes, but it took them a moment to have the doctors... Actually, no. It was the... Yeah, we'll get into this. The stoppage of the fight. Before we get into the finish of the fight, I just want to point out that the referee is not Big John, who we are accustomed to. Given that it is the first fight of the night, we have our alternate referee, who is actually Mario Yamasaki. A referee some of you might be familiar with. Perhaps not for the best reasons. Mario broke up a leg lock to check the cut, which had me extremely pissed off. Regardless of who is bleeding out of their head, you should not stop a leg lock to check a cut. You Unless wait it, until that shit's over or somebody taps. Like, it was a pretty bad cut. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not even arguing with, like, the fight needing to be stopped. That's not really my quarrel. My quarrel is wait, bro. Wait till the leg lock plays out. Maybe you won't even need to check the cut. Maybe somebody will tap. Like, give it 10, 20 seconds. The le a leg lock exchange is not going to take more than a minute. Yeah. Let it play out. Let the whole thing play out. A weird part of it was just how long it took them to break it up. Yeah, that was that was weird. And neither um, fighter wanted to stop. It seemed. Yeah, I think I think that's what we're going to lead into this fight with too. So you guys probably saw a little clip of like Mario failing to have any control over the cage whatsoever. Big John wouldn't have stood for that shit. No, he would start screaming and pin somebody to the wall. Off, yeah. Whereas Mario is just kind of like screaming, oh my god, stop. Too busy making heart signs at the camera. We don't have a picture for the finish from this fight because there was no finish, air quotes, from the fight. It was Dr. Stoppage. Yeah, Dr. Stoppage after the leg lock was broken up and Laverne had caused a severe enough cut to win the fight. 
So after winning twice in the prelims, Clark wins his main card debut. So he's doing pretty well so far, even if we don't see it so much. Even if the finish is not as climactic as we'd like it to be. Yeah. And that's UFC 20. Matt, what was your favorite fight on the card if you had to, had to pick? Probably Vanderlei Silva versus Tony Patera because that devastating knee was just great to see. The knee was very impressive. Because it's one of those... It reminded me of something like from Mortal Kombat. <laughs> or like... Like finish him type shit? Or like something from like a show where it's like... You, that setup is so rarely available. To like double hands on the back of the head, bring it down to the knee. Yeah, normally you To actually uh, see it is really impressive. Normally your opponent's a little wiser to that move. Wiser or just like isn't so worn from being kneed in the gut. My fight of the night would probably be Pedro and Trey, just for the brawl that they opened with. It was a very short fight, but most of the fights tonight were short, so I uh, enjoyed getting into the little flurry that they started things with. I like that we both picked actual knockouts. For our fight of the night? Yeah. And I did like the Trey fight, Trey and Pedro. I know people can't just, like, continuously brawl, or the few that can, the fights don't usually last that long. Not a lot of longevity. Yeah. That minute or two gap where they were both kind of just catching their breath, I think is what killed it for me, as far as uh, being a fight of the night. Uh, the intro was great, as far as, like, even the crowd loved it, because they just love people punching the shit That's out of each other. That's all they understand. <laughs> and then seeing the knockout... Someone falls down. They love that. Uh, I liked... I, I think they react. the crowd reacted more to your fight, but the concussiveness of it. You respect it. Yeah. And that's going to do it for us tonight. If you guys enjoyed the show, please be sure to tell us what you thought of UFC 20. Leave a comment. Hit the like button. Tell us what you thought of Vanderlei me and that man in the face. Um, I thought that we were still going to be on the UFC train for next time, but I've done a little bit of digging, and just by a few days, a difference of a few days, Pride 6 is before UFC 21. So next time, we're going to be traveling back to Yokohama Arena and coming back to you guys with Pride 6. Until then, hope you guys enjoyed the show, and see you next time. It's going to be nuts. Bye, we love you.